Good morning. I am really honored to be here. Um, uh, fine building has been a big part of my life for 30 years, and I've learned a ton. I still learn a ton. Uh, every single issue, I learned something. Um, it just it was really a, uh, it's just exciting to be here with giants in the industry like Mike Gerton and Steve Bazak and Martin Holliday, um, Peter Yost, and then um, the, the next generation of giants in the industry, Christine and Ben Bogey and Jake Breton. Um, uh, and, and, and they're all great speakers. <laughs> I'm not a great speaker. Uh, in fact, sometimes uh, I, you, you, you've heard somebody has a voice, uh, uh, has a face made for radio. Um, sometimes I think I have a, a uh, voice made for print. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've struggled with, with stuttering, stuttering my, my, my whole life. And um, so when, when Justin first asked if I wanted to do this, my immediate response was, hell no. <laughs> this is, uh, talking to 250 people is not in my comfort zone. But, um, but I think it's important for us to get outside of our comfort zones to do the things we think are important. Um, so, the, so this morning I'm talking um, the why, some of the whys about the Pretty Good House and what motivates me. Um, and then in my sessions, I'll be talking more about uh, details, the, the hows and the whats. And I'm, uh, I'm much more comfortable talking construction details. Um, so th uh, at one point, you know, I've, I've been a designer and builder off and on since I was a teenager. Um, I'm not an architect, but I, uh, these days I do mostly basically I do what an architect does. Um, I used to do things like this. Um, this is a, you know, a truckload of... Uh, Kaya and Sapili, African mahogany, uh, home theaters and uh, uh, paneled billiard rooms. We built all that on site. Um, this is, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for a custom kitchen with interesting details. Uh, this was a Better Homes and Gardens House of the Year in, in, uh, in the 1960s on the coast of Maine. We uh, dumped about a million dollars into it to make it pretty and fun. And uh, at the end of that project, I, I did the math and realized that uh, you know, this was I don't know, maybe eight years ago. It actually performs worse today than the 1960s house did. And uh, <laughs> as, I, uh, as, I, as I was growing and learning and going through my career, I, uh, I was learning more and more about the impact of what we do, how you know, it doesn't just affect us, it affects the greater environment. And uh, eventually, I just I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and at the same time, you know, this this is basically the uh, <laughs> at this point, this is the optimistic scenario. Uh, if if we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about half in the next 10 years and completely by 2050, then we have a reasonably good chance at slowing climate change to a rate that we can deal with. Um, you might have seen a graph like this. Uh, this is total. This is uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, uh, to, to, total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, ca carbon dioxide or carbon is used as shorthand to sort of consolidate the impact of all uh, global, global warming agents. So, you know, 32% is industry, that includes farming, you know, transportation is a big chunk, miscellaneous is a little bit. But buildings, you know, the operation and the construction of buildings is almost 40% of impacts where designers and builders we we're, we have a responsibility for this slice of the pie right here. Um, most of you probably already know this. Just operational carbon, operational emissions um, uh, is is the is the the emissions associated with what it takes to keep a building running, and uh, that's you know in total that's the biggest chunk of the pie here, and that's mostly what we've been focused on since I've been in this business is, is how do we get better energy efficiency? How do we convince clients to do better energy efficiency? Um, embodied carbon is similar, slightly different from embodied energy, but it's essentially it's the, it's the greenhouse gas emissions associated with what it takes to extract, you know, process, uh, trip, ship, transport, construct, maintain, and also ultimately dispose of a material. Um, and so this this big slice is operational. This little gray slice here, 11%, is that embodied carbon. Uh, P Peter Yost talked a little bit about this the other night. Uh, th this is basically my, my version of a graph from Bruce King's book, a little bit simplified. Um, if you take a typical building over a 100-year lifespan, 
almost all of your embodied carbon is spent on day one. Once you, once you move into that building, the embodied carbon is sunk and your operational carbons start ticking. So over the course of 100 years, you know, this isn't a specific building or specific ratio, but this, is, this isn't too far off a typical ratio. You know, over 100 years, operations dwarfs embodied carbon and the, the global warming potential, GWP, is on 100-year scale. So that's the total of all this. So of course, operating emissions are important, um, but we don't have 100 years. We probably don't even have 20 years. We have 10 years to get this thing solved. Uh, so even if we cut operational energy in half, you know, Passive House advertises 80% uh, reduction. It's usually more, actually more like 50%. But, but wherever it is, cutting that line down doesn't affect this. So we really need to think about the embodied carbon and what we're doing if we're going to um, address this climate issue. Um, this is a, another overwhelm, overwhelming statistic. Uh, uh, in the, uh, by 2060, over two trillion square feet of new space being built, the equivalent of building a whole New York City every 34 days. Um, and in the same time frame, about 75% of existing buildings are expected to be renovated. Um, uh, it's pretty overwhelming. What, what can we do about it? And people will say, you know, well, what about China? And what about India? Um, I'm reminded of the uh, wise words of my mother who said, uh, you worry about what's on your plate, let your brother worry about what's on his plate. So. <laughs> uh, this, this, is, this is on my plate, this is on your plate. Uh, for me personally, you know, I don't have kids. I'm a, you know, educated white male born in the US in the richest period of history. Like, I'm not worried about me. Uh, I'm worried about the next generations. The, <clears throat> uh, and other people are too. You know, la last week, over uh, six million people marched. Uh, over half a million just in, <clears throat> That's, that's Montreal, th thank you, Alexander. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's important, it matters. We have, there's something we can do about it. Um, for more information, much more eloquently and in detail, if you want to search uh, Ace, uh, Chris, and Jacob at the Nessie keynote this past year, uh, an hour plus um, keynote that generated a standing ovation, really great information. This is one of my Bibles, uh, Bruce King. Um, uh, I'd highly recommend reading that book. There's a lot of other resources, Building Green, Fine Hill Building, Green Building Advisor, but these are some of the key ones. Uh, so that's, that's the background. <clears throat> uh, pretty Good House, how many people here have heard of the Pretty Good House or know something about it? Okay, cool. Um, uh, in my sessions, we'll be talking a little more about what is the Pretty Good House. You know, I don't want to dwell on it if most people already know, but it's, you know, basically we have code minimum. The code keeps getting better as we, as we learned. Um, and we have Passive House. Passive House is awesome. Uh, LEED has some benefits. There are good pro all kinds of good programs out there. But essentially, um, ten years ago, we started a building science discussion group in Portland. Um, uh, uh, t ten years ago this week, actually. And um, after a couple of years of getting together, Dan Colbert, who's our moderator, and he started it. Um, he had just finished a Passive House that was challenging. He had done some LEED projects that he felt we're a little too much about ch checking boxes. Um, he certainly didn't want to go back to code minimum, but he was having trouble convincing clients to do better. So just, um, he just asked if we could brainstorm, what's a, what's a common sense building standard? What should we all be doing without having to reinvent the wheel every time? So we came up with a list of details. I wrote a blog about it. Martin published it on GBA, and it uh, kind of took on a, a uh, life of its own. Um, in my talk, we'll also be uh, covering um, uh, some, some of my details, you know, they're not the exciting latest, greatest details, maybe a couple of exceptions. You know, if you're already building, you know, passive houses out of straw bales, you may not get a whole lot out of my, <laughs> my talk. But if you're building conventional or if you want to do a little better, if you want to just s sort of share some ideas, I want to learn from you as well. What's, what's your favorite wall assembly? I'll show a few of mine. Um, uh, so, so last year after the UN's uh, climate report came out, uh, we got together again, decided that, you know, Pretty Good House was, you know, it was, you know, it did involve, we did have, you know, embodied energy over there. Uh, but we decided to really, to sort of redo it, really incorporating embodied carbon. So it's, it's not just thinking about what makes sense for that client, what, what should we be doing to address the greater good. Um, and as part of this effort and sort of getting the word out, you know, if, if uh, 
we've uh, put together a, a pretty good house website, uh, long, long in the works. Uh, Bob Swinburne, architect, is here somewhere. He's done the bulk. Of, there's Bob. Uh, he's done the bulk of the work and actually getting it up and running. Um, this is not meant to compete with uh, Final Building or GBA or anybody. It's supposed to be just. Um, there's so much information on other websites that people get, I hear time and time again, people just get confused. There's too much information. How do you sift through it? So, so we're just trying to provide a very simple starting point for people. Maybe someplace you send clients, new hires, and we'll have links to read in depth, go as far down rabbit holes as you want on you know, GBA or Building Science Corp or Fine Home Building. Um, then the other thing I want, so that's, that's my talk. The other thing I want to mention, the P, uh, Pretty Good House is really, it's, it's a product, it's a result of this building science discussion group. Um, you know, conferences like this are amazing. You get to, you know, get to spend a few days, you know, with your peers and learning and uh, all that good stuff. But it's a commitment. It's time, it's money. Uh, there's a growing number of building science discussion groups where it's just informally get together, maybe have a beer, talk about a building science topic. It can be, you know, non-political. It can be just, just the business at hand of, you know, how do we ventilate this roof? Uh, so this is the long-running one in Portland. As far as I know, it's the original. There may be others or may have been inspirations, but th this, is, this is 10 years now. Um, I was in Portland for 10 years, but I moved you know, to, to a, r a rural part of Maine. Um, but I didn't really have a network there, and driving to Portland was a, it's, it's a bit of a drive, so I decided to start my own. So I'm in, I'm in a very rural area. I just started advertising, hey, let's get together at the local microbrewery uh, once a month and talk about something. And uh, most months we have anywhere from 10 to 25 people show up just to chat. It's, it's really been great. So Travis and Joe from Catalyst are here somewhere. There we are. <laughs> uh, they saw my, my posts on Instagram and uh, liked the idea and asked, asked if they could, could, could borrow the name. I said, absolutely. I don't, you know, anybody who wants the name, please take it if you like it. You know, BS stands for building science, obviously. Uh, uh, so they're... <laughs> Uh, they're, uh, they're outside of Kansas City, so they've traveled a ways to be here, but they're sort of holding, you know, starting to create a, a building science uh, hub there in the middle of the country. Uh, Nathan is here somewhere from Chattanooga, right here in the front. Uh, he started a group. So um, uh, in southern Vermont and Brattleboro, the, the uh, Sion that Peter Yost mentioned, uh, uh, P Peter and Bob Swinburne and, and uh, Guy Payne and some others have a group going there. Uh, Northern Vermont and Burlington, there's this group. Um, so in Western Mass in the Berkshires, there's the uh, Berkshires Building Science Forum. Uh, Brad Morse from uh, Uncarved Block and some others uh, put that one together. Um, in the greater Boston area, Paul Elgin Camp and uh, uh, Kate Stevenson and these, these groups um, do something similar. Uh, in the planning phase, Randy Williams is here somewhere. Was, there he is. Uh, he's he's gearing up, and we're going to keep on him to get one going in uh, northern uh, northern Minnesota. We'll have the, the Minnesota BS and beer, um, and then in upstate New York in the Lake Placid area, a couple of architects, uh, Tim McCarthy and um, Jesse Schwartzberg, are planning to gear up a BS and beer for this fall. So, if I can do it, if they can do it, you can do it. Just put out the word, and they will come. I uh, hope to see some of you later. Thank you.